name is Betsy Stewart, and I'm the Director of Advancement Communications here at LLS, and I'll serve as our moderator for today. I'm so pleased to welcome you to our very special annual Women Curing Cancer event. Before we get started today, we have just a few housekeeping items. Please note that this uh, event is being recorded. All of our audio is currently disabled, just in order to cut down on background noise. We would love to see you as part of today's celebration. So please, if you're able, keep your video on during the event. Um, to best enjoy today's event, we suggest choosing the speaker view in the upper right-hand corner of your Zoom screen. And after today's very special conversation, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions in the chat function. Simply type your question into the chat box and I'll read it aloud. Now, when you type it in, it will go to everybody automatically. But if you'd like to remain anonymous, you can choose moderator in the two section. And that will mean that I'll read it out loud. If we don't get to your question during today's event, we'll make sure to provide you with an answer as a follow-up to today's gathering. So that takes care of our housekeeping items. Now I'd like to turn it over to our president and chief executive officer, Dr. Luis DeGenero. Good afternoon. It is my great honor to welcome you today to this special celebration. Earlier this month, we celebrated International Women's Day here at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society with a spotlight on some of the extraordinary women whose research is funded through the LLS Grants Program. They're just a few of the smart, tenacious, committed women working to realize new cures for patients, just as all of you are. Thank you for being here with us, and thank you for your involvement with Women Curing Cancer. Women philanthropists and volunteers have been the driving force behind so much meaningful progress in this country for centuries. LLS's earliest efforts were spearheaded by women. We are part of a rich history that began with a mother mourning her son and a family working tirelessly to help others facing blood cancers. Antoinette de Villiers, together with her husband, Rudolph, created what we now know as the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society in memory of their 16-year-old son, Robbie. Their steadfast belief that blood cancers are curable is what drives us today. We all know the importance and the power of collective action, passion, and dedication. I'm so glad that LLS and the many patients and families who look to us for support can rely on you. With that, I want to play a short video to kick off this very special event. Thank you again for joining us today.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's program. I am Evelyn Beta, co-founder of LLS Women Curing Cancer, along with Lynn O'Brien, who you will hear from shortly. Many of you have attended our past Women Curing Cancer events in person, and it is good to see you again. For those new to our community, thank you so much for joining us. Through this event, you will be impressed with the impact that women can and do have on the future of blood cancer care. We have remarkable drive and resilience when we put our minds to something important that we want to accomplish, and even more so when we put our collective energies together. Three years ago, Lynn and I became intrigued by the idea of harnessing that incredible energy to advance cures even more for patients with blood cancer. Working with partners of the DC office of LLS, Women Curing Cancer evolved. Philanthropy is at the heart of this group because LLS is doing extraordinary work to advance research and support patients and families. And of course, this work requires financial support. Many of you have generously gifted. Thank you for your incredible kindness. Beyond the critical funding, our vision is to provide a forum where women can come together to learn from researchers and emerging visionaries, to share in the success of innovative treatments, and to connect with patients and families who have experienced blood cancers and learn from their journeys, like Suleika's who will be speaking with us today. We will become a powerful voice for LLS and for those this organization serves. Each of you has a personal reason for being with us today. My hope is that you come away from this program inspired and motivated to join us in participating, partnership, supporting the mission in the area most important to you, this may be research, patient support, the children's initiative, or other interests that you have. The video we just saw was titled Unstoppable. And looking at the faces out there on my screen, I see an unstoppable, powerful group of leaders who are a catalyst to a world without blood cancer. It is a privilege to be with you today. Now, I'm pleased to introduce WCC co-founder, Lynn O'Brien, who will share more about our program. Thank you. Great, Th thank you so much, Evelyn. Um, I have to say that you really nailed it when you said that women curing cancer is about being inspired to harness the power that women have to achieve a vision of a world without blood cancer. For me, it is also very much about that. Oh, I just saw that picture of my family. <laughs> also uh, something else. Uh, for me, women curing cancer is also about giving back to a field and an organization that literally saved my life. And it's about giving to patients and families who are also facing the massively difficult journey of blood cancer and helping to make sure that their stories are as positive as mine. I was diagnosed with chronic lymphocytic leukemia or CLL in 2012 and got involved with LS shortly after that. I started with team and training, running half marathons. My whole family has done team and training races with me and light the night. And also my son has run two New York marathons for LS. I'm on a drug now that I didn't know about when I was diagnosed that was funded and approved by LS last year for CLL. And I have to tell you, and it's an amazing feeling to know that I participated in making this happen, not just for myself, but for other people with CLL and also other people with cancers, blood cancers and beyond. This is because Blood cancer is a gateway to other cancers and diseases since everything starts with the blood. And this is why raising funds for LLS is such a powerful way to change the future. I feel like at LLS, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. The advances we are supporting today are building on the advances they've made possible in the past. We have our hands literally in everything that is cut, cutting edge. And I do believe that LLS is going to find a cure for leukemia and other cancers. This is what inspires me every day and that's why I'm so proud and excited to be talking to all of you today. 
to share the incredible opportunity we have to drive real change for patients and families. At this point, I'm really excited to introduce our special guest today, Suleika Jawad. I learned about Suleika and I was, as my husband who was on here knows, I read late into the night and I was reading my Princeton Alumni Weekly Magazine and I remembered reading about her in the same magazine a few years ago. Immediately, sorry, at midnight, I started texting friends and connecting on Instagram with people who had children in the same class as her at Princeton or who followed her on Instagram. A lot of those Princeton women are on the call. Um, and I also saw Ida Peterson followed her um, and she is someone from my hometown who has AML and is on the call and we'll hear later. And through some of these amazing women, I was able to connect with Suleika. So my introduction to Suleika, um, it's pretty incredible. And I should say up front, you're all going to get a copy of her book. She is the author of the instant New York Times bestseller memoir, Between Two Kingdoms. She wrote an Emmy award-winning New York Times column called Life Interrupted, and her reporting and essays have been featured in New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, Vogue, and NPR, among others. A highly sought after speaker, her main stage TED Talk was one of, was one of the 10 most popular in 2019 and had nearly 4 million views. She's also the creator of the Isolation Journals, a community creativity project founded during COVID to help others convert their isolation into artistic solitude. And over 100,000 people from around the world have joined. So in addition to being a New York Times bestseller author this month, I'm happy to say that her partner, John Baptiste, who is known um, in the band Stay Human on Stephen Colbert, also was nominated last week for an Oscar for his music from Pixar Soul. So it's been quite a month for them. But you are in a real treat and a deeply inspiring conversation. Suleika will be interviewed by LLS's Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Gwen Nichols, herself an incredibly motivational speaker, visionary leader at LLS, and one of the most compassionate people I've ever had the fortune to meet. In fact, I should add, she's always the person I call when someone is introduced to me with leukemia, and she has helped me every single time. So before I turn this over to Gwen and Suleika, I wanna encourage you to ask questions by posting them in the chat on the bottom of your screen, and you can direct your questions to Betty by choosing moderator if you'd like your question asked um, anonymously. So with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Oh, we can't hear you, Gwen. Really appreciate you stepping forward, Lynn. And uh, I am very excited um, to ask Suleika a few questions. But first, I'd like her to read an excerpt from uh, Between Two Kingdoms. Uh, Suleika, would you please? Please, yes. Uh, thank you, everyone. I so wish we were all gathered together in person, but I've loved scrolling through uh, the different screens and seeing some familiar faces. Um, I should just say, I've been looking forward to this for a very long time. LLS has a very special place in my heart. And because of the pandemic, I don't person reading. So this is a real treat. Um, okay, I'll just read a short passage. Uh, that I hope helps clarify the title of my book, which is Between Two Kingdoms. Everyone who is born holds dual citizenship in the kingdom of the well and in the kingdom of the sick, Susan Sontag wrote in Illness as Metaphor. Although we all prefer to use only the good passport, sooner or later each of us is obliged, at least for a spell, to identify ourselves as citizens of that other place. By the time I reached my last day of chemo, I'd spent the majority of my adult life in that other realm, the kingdom of the sick no one cares to inhabit. Initially, I'd clung to the hope of a short sojourn, one in which I wouldn't have to unpack my bags. I'd resisted the label of cancer patient, believing I could remain the person I'd been. But as I grew sicker, I'd watch my old self vanish. In place of my name, I had been issued a patient ID number. I learned to speak fluent medicalese. Even my molecular identity had morphed. When my brother's stem cells engrafted in my marrow, my DNA had irreversibly mutated. With my bald head, pallor, and port, illness became the first thing that people noticed about me. As months bled into years, I'd adapted to the mores of this new land as best I could. 
befriended its inhabitants, even carved out a career within its confines. In its terrain, I'd built a home, accepting not only that I might stay there for a while, but that likely I would never leave. It was the outside world, the kingdom of the well that had grown alien and frightening. But for me, for all patients, the end goal is eventually to leave the kingdom of the sick. In many cancer wards, there's a bell that patients ring on their last day of treatment, a ceremonial tolling that signals a transition. It's time to say goodbye to the eerie and changeless fluorescence of hospital rooms. It's time to step back into sunlight. It is where I find myself now, on the threshold between an old familiar state and an unknown future. Cancer no longer lives in my blood, but it lives on in other ways, dominating my identity, my relationships, my work, and my thoughts. I'm done with the chemo, but I still have my port, which my doctors are waiting to remove until I'm further out of the woods. I'm left with the question of how to repatriate myself to the kingdom of the well and whether I ever fully can. No treatment protocols or discharge instructions can guide this part of my trajectory. The way forward is going to have to be my own. Thank you. And I, I'm guessing that everyone on this call now uh, understands why we were so excited to have you join us. Um, I have the, the great privilege of asking you a few questions and I thought um, that perhaps the first would be about the fact that you were incredibly young when, um, when this hit. You were just a college graduate. You were starting out on your first job in a new city and had everything to look forward to. And um, can you tell us something about that transition to really like understanding that you had cancer? It seems impossible when you are a 20 something. Thank you, Gwen. It's so true. I mean, I think like a lot of, you know, young people, um, I didn't think about illness. I felt very much immortal. Um, and when I graduated from college in 2010, um, you know, I felt the usual kind of existential angst that recent college graduates feel. Um, and while I didn't quite know who I was or what I wanted to do in the world, the future felt limitless with possibility. Um, and, you know, I had these dreams of becoming a writer, although it seemed difficult to even begin to understand how to go about achieving that. And so my first job as a college, out of college was as a paralegal at a law firm in Paris. And I was so excited to get the chance to live abroad. Um, but very quickly, uh, within a few short months of being in Paris, um, I began to notice all kinds of different symptoms. Uh, I had become so pale that I looked almost translucent. Um, I was always coming down with some new bout of bronchitis or some cold. Um, and I went to see about half a dozen doctors. And every time I um, would be given antibiotics or treated for whatever specific symptom I'd shown up with that day and sent home. Um, and at the end of that, I was actually hospitalized for a week. And um, I underwent every test that the doctors could think of except for a bone marrow biopsy, uh, which they didn't think was necessary for someone um, of my age. And, you know, there was this way in which, way in which I didn't feel taken seriously. Um, but the truth was, I don't know that I was taking myself seriously. Um, I didn't feel empowered to push back. I didn't know, you know, how to necessarily speak up for myself. And when I was released from the hospital, I was actually given a diagnosis of burnout syndrome and told to take some time off of work and to rest. Um, but some part of me knew that something was seriously much, wrong. Much um, worse, yeah. And so anyway, I ended up on a flight home to New York 
and was shortly thereafter diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. And I never returned uh, to Paris. I never returned to my apartment or my job. And that diagnosis um, was really, you know, one of those bifurcating moments when everything, as the great writer Joan Didion says, changes in a single ordinary instant. There was my life before and everything that came after. You know, as a, as a doctor, I found one of the hardest things to try and help patients even un vaguely understand was how overwhelming being in the hospital for treatment of leukemia is, how it takes over your life and your world, you know, the people around you as well. Um, it, it's just very hard to convey how everything else that's important to you comes to a standstill. And I wondered if you experienced something like that and what the toll was on you when you, when you finally realized what, you know, that, that bifurcation in the path, mm. and what it meant. Yeah, I think, you know, there's the, the overwhelm factor is almost indescribable. Um, you're not just, you know, scrambling to learn more about your health insurance um, and, and figuring out how to navigate the medical system and how to even understand some of the medical ease that's being thrown at you. Um, but then there's the psychological imprint of that experience, the fear, the incredible uncertainty, um, the difficulty of navigating conversations with friends and family, uh, you know, the mountains of unsolicited medical advice that suddenly get thrown at you. Um, I got everything from, you know, ideas of how to cure my leukemia with apricot kernels uh, to juice cleanses and coffee enemas. Um, and, you know, I, um, I think within that overwhelm, uh, it's incredibly difficult to know what to do as the patient. You have to immediately cede so much control to your doctors, to the treatment protocols. Um, and in my experience, you know, the one kind of salve or balm to that was understanding that, you know, as the old saying goes, knowledge is power. Um, and I learned that very quickly. And Although at that point I hadn't had the opportunity to become a journalist, I decided to approach my leukemia as a journalist might. I, you know, scoured uh, the internet for, um, you know, stories of fellow patients. I called friends of friends who'd had similar diagnoses. I um, approached my doctor's visits like interviews, uh, <laughs> which I'm sure my doctors were annoyed by. Um, but it was the one thing that I could control and, and that importance of learning how to advocate for yourself was the lesson I retroactively learned after, you know, almost six months of being misdiagnosed and feeling too shy or kind of disempowered in those, um, you know, waiting rooms or, or hospital rooms to speak up for myself. No, I, th I think that's uh, understandable. Uh, you were, uh, you know, <laughs> just brand new to all of it. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested because I think there are a lot of, you know, parents on this call and particularly moms who are, you know, thinking about their own kids and feeling for your mother um, saying, you know, the, the one thing that you can't imagine, and I'll start tearing up in my own <laughs> thoughts, uh, is your own child getting a critical illness or a life-threatening illness um, instead of you? Uh, and I wondered if you could, you know, you, you in the book, you, you talk about your family very lovingly and very dearly. And I'd like to hear a little bit about the role that your mom played, and I'm sure others would too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you're lucky, uh, to have parents, to have friends or family there to support you. And, you know, I had the heartbreak of witnessing many patients uh, during the years I was in treatment who didn't have 
that kind of support. Um, I think you very quickly realize that when a patient gets diagnosed, it's not just them. It, you know, fundamentally changes and, and impacts an entire family. Um, and I think for, you know, my mom is my primary caregiver. She ended up taking off almost two years of work in order to do that. And I was treated at, in New York City, which was about a four hour drive from our house. So we were together all the time. Um, and I think, you know, without ever really consciously doing it, we were both trying to protect each other. Um, I wanted to be strong for her. She wanted to be stoic and brave and positive for me. Um, but there was this way in which we never actually talked about the elephant in the room, the you know severity of my um, of my disease, uh, the kind of grimness of my prognosis. Um, and it was only, you know, a couple months later when a videographer friend accompanied me to an appointment uh, and I watched the footage that I was really struck by one particular moment. And there was this moment when um, I was sitting on a hospital exam table, laughing and chatting with my doctor and the camera zooms in on my mom who's sitting in the background. And she had this look on her face that I can only describe as a look of complete devastation. Um, and I turned and looked back at her and she quickly rearranged her face into a big smile. And I was really struck by that because I realized the reason I had never seen that look on my mother's face is because she hadn't wanted me to see that look on her face. Um, and it was a really sobering uh, realization for me about just how indescribably difficult it is to see someone you love get very sick and especially to be the parent of a child who's very sick. Well, thank you for talking about the support that you had and, and being so open about your mom. I think you know that that's one of the things LLS realizes that there are a lot of people who don't have insurance, who don't have a boyfriend and a wonderful mom and dad and the kind of, you know, a family that can uh, provide them what they need, take time off to help you. Uh, and so thanks for mentioning that. Um, I, I wanted to all, you know, I love the parts in the book when you talked about the, the friends that you made, the real bonds that you made with other, particularly with other young people who were undergoing uh, cancer therapy uh, when you were in the hospital and during your entire uh, journey. And I wish you'd talk a little bit and tell people about some of these because they're just one, you know, uh, it's heartbreaking because be being an oncologist, I know some of them will be lost to you and that you will have friends that you'll lose way too early. Mm. But the friendships and the support and the, it was just such a warm and wonderful thing to read about. So tell us a little more. Well, I love talking about them and I loved writing about them. Um, you know, I think strangely for, for me um, at 22, I was about a year too old for pediatrics, but often, um, you know, decades younger than some of the other patients in the adult oncology unit. Um, and I think, you know, in some ways, worse than, you know, the side effects of my treatment, worse than uh, my diagnosis, worse than the fear and the uncertainty was that sense of profound isolation. Um, and very quickly, you know, there was this way in which I understood that um, it was becoming increasingly difficult for me to relate to my healthy friends. I would go on social media and I'd see pictures of them, you know, traveling and starting new jobs and going to parties and all the rest of the big and small milestones. Um, so very early on, I made it my mission to find other young adult cancer patients who would be my friends. And, um, you know, by, you know, the second year that I was in treatment, we, I had found a little crew of friends. Um, there was my friend, Max Ritvo, the late Max Ritvo, who had Ewing sarcoma who's an extraordinary poet. Uh, there was my friend, 
Melissa Carroll, um, who's a painter, and I have two of her paintings up here. Um, I have another one here from my friend Daniel Cordani, uh, an ALL survivor and bone marrow transplant survivor. I have my friend Bahita right here, who is a breast cancer survivor, and I keep all of their artwork uh, in my writing space um, because their friendship truly was a thing that sustained me during my most difficult passage. It's what sustains and inspires me now. And I think uh, to find community, whether it's a pre-existing one or, or one that you imagine and create for yourself um, is so important. And it's a cliche, but it's a true one. Uh, but when someone gets sick, it, it takes a village. And it's not until you get sick that you realize how many people become crucial to your ability to endure and to survive from the doctors to the nurses and social workers um, to organizations like LLS and to our fellow patients. Well, I, I, that came through loud and clear. Uh, I think I have time for one more question. And, and I think when people read your book, they will really be struck by the depth and the beauty of those friendships um, and your ability to describe your friends, which is really extraordinary. Um, in the sort of post-treatment part of your book, you go on an adventure. And, uh, and I, you know, when I read about that, uh, my sort of feeling was you needed to find out you needed to go out and discover who you were going to be in this post-treatment world and how to how to see the world again. And you went and talked to a lot of people who had written to you, had, had communicated with you. Um, and it's a really it's really a fun adventure to read about. I you know so I saw that as a um, a young person who had opened the Pandora's box, which you have to, of understanding mortality at, a, at an age when most other young people don't. Um, mm -hmm. And that was my interpretation, probably because as a 20 something, I also on the other side as a doctor had to you know, come to grips with mortality in a different way than others. But I wondered what you want, um, what you'd like readers to take out of this and if there's, uh, you know, a sort of, a, you know, a bit of advice or a bit of way to read this part of the book, uh, and what you'd like them to come away with. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, there's such a big focus on, on finding cures, as there should be. Um, but I also think the kind of hard work of healing doesn't just end with a cure. Um, uh, that experience of survivorship was a surprising one for me. Um, I expected to kind of eagerly and organically fold back into the rhythms of living and that did not happen for me. Um, I was, you know, reeling from almost three and a half years of treatment from the long-term side effects of that experience, from the grief of losing uh, so many friends um, to cancer and I really needed to kind of create my own rite of passage to help me bridge the distance between no longer and not yet, because I wasn't a cancer patient anymore. And I knew that I couldn't return necessarily to the 22 year old person I'd been, but I had to figure out who I was. Um, and the way that I chose to do that was by seeking out people who were, um, you know, enduring their own aftermaths, their own reckonings, who might have some guidance about how to not move on from this experience, because I think moving on is a myth, but to learn to move forward with it. Great. Well, I can say thank you for from everyone on this call. Um, it really has been a great pleasure and we're really very thankful that you agreed to come join us. I'm sure everyone is looking forward to going right away to read the book. So uh, uh, thank you and, um, you know, hear all the applause from all the muted people because it really was wonderful. Uh, and um, 
now I guess uh, I am turning this uh, over to me. <laughs> um, and uh, who do I turn it over Thank to? You. To Bethy? Ver no, to or me. to Lynn? <laughs> to me. Thank you. All Thank right. You so much, Thank you, Lynn. And to Laika, it's, it's so amazing to hear you speak after reading the book, um, which again was one of those late night page turners for me. Um, I want to remind everyone that you're welcome to ask questions by putting them in the chat. Um, at this time, I want to introduce a very special guest who has joined today's presentation and was my inspiration at the beginning when I was reading the book, um, Ida Peterson, now a Hardin, who just, she actually recently just got married and turns 30 on Monday uh, and is from McLean. She was diagnosed with AML in July 2020 and started treatment right away. Uh, she's being treated at Johns Hopkins Hospital and after many rounds of chemo. She's made it to her transplant, which was on February 18th. Uh, she's currently in day 35 of uh, transplant. And um, I have to add that she already had a team with LLS. Um, I know they had hashtag Ida the Fida um, and many women <laughs> on the call uh, helped raise money, well over $100,000 already for LLS. And I believe that her Suleika's book has helped Ida understand more about transplants and what the future will be like once she's better. And so Ida, I want to say thank you so much uh, for joining us and adding to our conversation. And I know you have a question for Suleika. Yeah, Suleika, it's so nice to meet you. And Lynn, thank you so much for having me. I feel completely honored to be here. Um, and Suleika, again, your book has helped. Um, and I know that my dad has actually reached out to your dad um, asking for help. This is totally a family diagnosis and uh, my dad my family appreciates that so much so please thank your dad and thank you for opening up to everyone oh, thank you and I have to say you know as soon as my my family told me about you I was immediately rooting for you and following her along and please count me among your new uh, biggest fans <laughs> thank you I appreciate that um, I feel like we've covered this a little bit today, but, um, you know, I feel like you read a perfect passage earlier um, and trying to understand how you feel now that you've kind of made your career around your cancer. Um, do you feel that you've been labeled for your cancer? And if so, how do you feel about that? Does it constantly bring back memories? You know, I'm in a situation where I've posted on social media um, and all of my friends know what's going on. So I'm not sure how to go back into the real world once I hopefully am over this hump of, uh, hopefully, you know, I'm done soon. I, I'm hoping. <laughs> um, but yeah, so anyways, how do you feel about kind of reliving it over and over? I've been on a few of your calls, um, obviously read your book and uh, I can't imagine, you know, reliving it over and over again. Thank you. It's such a good question. You know, um, I think that was that idea of, yeah, being kind of pigeonholed into this identity was a fear when I first emerged from treatment. And I remember having a conversation um, with the author, Cheryl Strayed, who was someone I really admired. And I was thinking about writing a book. And I said to her something like, I know I want to write a book, but I don't want to write about cancer. In fact, I'm desperate to write about anything else. Um, and she said something to me um, that I still think a lot. You'll write the story you need to write and you have no business trying to avoid that. Um, I also think that piece of advice extends to the identity question. There is this way in which, you know, at that point, um, cancer had sort of engulfed so much of my life and I was trying to figure out how to make space for other things and how to kind of navigate uh, survivorship. Um, but the truth is uh, at that point in my life, it was the central thing still. Um, and trying to kind of dodge it or compartmentalize it didn't help. Um, and now, you know, it's still a big part of my life. It will always be a part of my life. Um, and I've kind of learned to accept that. And in the acceptance of that, um, it's made space for other things. I've been working on a bunch of different projects that um, I'm very happy to report have nothing to do with me, uh, any aspect of my life, cancer included. Um, but it's been a gradual process. And I think, um, you know, uh, 
a, a big part of that healing process for me has been learning to kind of exist in the in-between, um, to not like think in binary terms of like cancer patient or healthy person or sick or well, and to understand that there's a way in which all of those parts of myself and my experience can all kind of coexist. That's great. Thank you. So we have a few other questions um, from our guests today. One is, um, so Leica, we're wondering if you participated in a clinical trial and if so, what that experience was like for you navigating that process. Uh, yeah, so, you know, when I first got diagnosed, I um, entered the hospital and spent about six weeks undergoing uh, a standard chemotherapy regimen called seven plus three and then staying in the hospital for a lot longer than that because of the side effects. Um, and when I entered the hospital, I think I'd had about 30% leukemic blasts in my marrow. And by the end of that treatment, I had 70% blasts in my marrow. And so obviously that treatment did not work for me. And I suddenly found myself in this very scary place. Um, and so I, you know, at the urging of my doctors ended up enrolling uh, in a phase two clinical trial. Um, and my first you know, reaction when I heard uh, about this idea of joining a clinical trial was absolutely not. Um, I was so afraid. Um, everything already felt so uncertain. And I think I, you know, had these kind of preconceived notions about what a clinical trial entailed, what it meant uh, that weren't accurate. Um, and, you know, that clinical trial saved my life. I got that blast count to below 5% so that I could have a bone marrow transplant with my brother as my donor. Um, and so I have um, a, a deep, um, you know, admiration for the research and the scientists and the organizations like LLS that fund clinical trials, because it's not an exaggeration to say that I would not, you know, that, that I would not be alive today if it weren't for that trial. Thanks. Um, I think we have time just for one more question. We're also wondering um, what, if you could talk a little bit more, you mentioned uh, about what's next for you and the projects that you're working on, if you're able to share any more about what's next for you. Yeah, so um, I'm working on my next book. Uh, it's my sort of side mistress project uh, that I probably shouldn't be working on right now. Um, and I have also been working on this project called the Isolation Journals since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and we send out journaling prompts and uh, words of inspiration from different writers and musicians and community leaders. One of my favorite prompts is actually from a six-year-old brain cancer patient by the name of Lou Sullivan. Uh, and it's just been a really beautiful project. It's a free email newsletter. Um, and by the end of that first month, we had so many people who joined from around the world that I decided to keep it going. So that's been uh, my my baby that's grown into a, a kind of all-consuming, uh, unwieldy toddler that I'm still trying to figure out how to wrangle. Thank you so much. Lynn, I'll, I'll pass it back over to you now. Thank you. And so like, I love your writing uh, room. Is it, you said it's a little cabin and you're Backyard. It's actually uh, the potting shed in my backyard, and it doesn't have heat with the exception of an old wood stove, which, as I said to you, sounds far more romantic than it actually is. <laughs> it actually does sound romantic. Well, thank you again so much, Juleka and Dr. Nichols and Ida. Um, I really learned so much from the discussion, and I know I speak for everyone when I say how much, um, Suleika, your time meant to us today. And I truly hope you'll stay connected with LLS because you and your story are truly a gift to us. And at this point, if you, if there's a couple more little surprises in store, and if you haven't shed a tear yet, um, I'd like to say at this point, we have a special guest and friend of LLS, uh, Charles Chip Esten, who is an actor and musician and plays uh, Deacon Claiborne on the TV show Nashville. 
Um, this year, he is LLS's Light the Night uh, Walk Honorary Chair, National Honor Honorary Chair. And his 21-year-old daughter, Addie, was diagnosed with leukemia at two and a half. And thanks to advances in treatment, she's doing incredibly well and thriving today. And because of their personal connection to blood cancer, Charles, his wife, Patty, and the entire Eston clan are strong supporters of LLS. And he has been, sent us a special message for today, which we'll show you now. Hello, everybody. Charles Eston here. Um, very grateful for the opportunity, even if I'm not able to do this live, at least to have a video and to say, well done, Women Curing Cancer. What an incredible organization. Just strong women, like-minded spirits, generous hearts, all coming together to move the needle on cancer cures and to increase access to those that need them. Um, my story, my wife and I, 20 years ago, our daughter, Addie, was diagnosed with leukemia. And that was an extraordinarily scary time for us. She was only two and a half at the time. And um, it was a moment where you begin to feel alone and it doesn't feel like there's a lot of light. Um, but with the help of some incredible doctors and nurses at Cedar sinai and for all the research and fundraising for the research that had gone before, our little Addie is now a junior in college and she plays division one soccer. She is happy and healthy. She's extraordinary. And we live our lives in deep gratitude now, trying to do what we can to help raise money. Our particular <laughs> charity is definitely LLS, uh, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Now we're so grateful to them and we see how beautifully they are run and how well um, they do fundraise and they do make sure that the money gets where it needs to go. So thank you, LLS, and thank you. When I think of the fact that you're all there with this one thing in mind, I don't think cancer has a chance when you have organizations like yours. I wanna actually introduce now a song that I didn't uh, just record, but wrote with a friend of mine. Her name is Jillian Cartarelli, and she was telling me the story about her mother, who was and is a cancer survivor. And the word she kept coming up with was strong when she was des describing her mom. So that is the title of our song. It's about being strong and how sometimes there are moments where you don't feel strong. My wife and I did not feel strong in that moment. Our little Addie did not feel strong in that moment. So other people, other organizations come alongside and they help you find your strength. That's what you're doing for other people. So I hope that you'll appreciate this song dedicated to my friend Jillian's strong mama and to all you strong women who are out there kicking cancer's butt. Thanks again. Have a great conference. This is Strong. We're just having a tech uh, issue. We'll, we'll be uh, up with the video in just a minute. When I was just a little girl, frightened by this great big world around me, she calmed me down. And in those teenage years when things got rough, I'd give in and I'd give up. She'd be right there for me. My mama gave me strength and told me I could do it. She's the only reason I got through it. She said, be strong. When times are tough and everything goes wrong You can cry those tears, but when they're gone 
you carry on, you be strong. On that winter night when I got that call, she calmly explained it all. I cried and asked God why. Doctor said it was her last spring. She said, doctors don't know everything. She's still here after four hard years of fighting. Faithfully, so gracefully, till she recovered. She amazed us all. That's my mother. She's strong. Times were tough and everything went wrong. She fought through those tears and now they're gone. She carried on. She's strong. She still worries about me though. Will I be fine when she's called home? I said that'll hurt like hell, but my mama taught me well, so I'll be strong. When you're not here with me where you belong, yes I'll cry those tears when you are gone, but I'll Your voice will be inside me like a song And I'll miss you, Mom But I'll be strong Great. Thank you so much, Charles, for a wonderful tribute. Wasn't that beautiful? Um, what a tribute to the strength of cancer patients everywhere. Um, your daughter, Addie, is a wonderful model of a powerful and resilient young woman, and I'm so glad we have an advocate in you and your family. It's now my privilege to introduce a dear friend and fellow co-chair of this event, Marla Persky. Marla and I serve on the LLS National Board together, and I've learned so much from her passion and I admire her ability to motivate others to do and be their best. So thank you, Marla. I'm thrilled to be here today. Thank you all. And Lynn and Evelyn, great to be a co-chair right along with you. And I also wanna add my thanks to all of you who have joined us here today. Like many others you've heard from, this is very personal because blood cancer has darkened my door twice. The first time was in 1995 when my daughter was six years old and she was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia or it's also called ALL. This started us on a three-year odyssey of treatments designed to eliminate her cancer and save her life. And I can happily report that today she is a healthy, happy and very productive 32-year-old woman. The second time was four years ago when a very dear cousin of mine was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia, AML. Alan went through a year of grueling treatments culminating in a stem cell transplant only to lose his life from the fallout of graft versus host disease. Alan left behind a wife, three children, two grandchildren, as well as students, friends, and colleagues. Alan was a chemistry professor. When I learned about women curing cancer, I immediately wanted to be part of what was happening in this group of very visionary women. Since our launch in 2018, Women Curing Cancer has raised more than three million for LLS. And this money has been used to support groundbreaking research and support families and patients. But there is so much more to do. 
Besides the physical and emotional costs of blood cancer diagnoses, there's a huge economic toll on patients and their families. An LLS study found that three years following a cancer diagnosis, families can spend between 200 and $800,000, and much of this is not covered by insurance. This is why one of Women Curing Cancer's priorities is increasing funding for LLS's Urgent Need Program, which helps patients with their basic needs so they can focus their energies on getting well. Women Curing Cancer also funds promising research on new therapies that provide lasting cures. Bringing new treatments from the laboratory to a patient is extraordinarily expensive. Each new therapy costs tens of millions of dollars to develop. Getting back to Charles's daughter, Addie, and my daughter, Samantha, Women Curing Cancer is focusing on funding the LLS Children's Initiative and specifically PEDAL, Pediatric Acute Leukemia Master Trial. And we're doing this in order to find new cures for children with blood cancer. Children are not little adults when it comes to cancer treatments. Testing therapies on young children is amazingly complex. In fact, in the last 40 years, only four oncology drugs have been approved for first use in children. If my daughter, Samantha, was four years old or five years old and diagnosed today, she would be receiving the same treatment she received in 1995. Nothing else has been approved. The cause of LLS and women curing cancer is personal to many of us. That's why I sit on the LLS board of directors and I'm a member of Women Curing Cancer because if we don't do everything we possibly can to find cures and to help families through these trying times, who will? I wanna thank my fellow inaugural members of Women Curing Cancer whose names you see here today, right on the screen in front of you. These women have helped launch this initiative and we've had tremendous impact. Together we make a difference. We save lives. Philanthropy is power and it's never too early to start. I'd like to now introduce Stella, our newest honorary member of the Women Curing Cancer Sisterhood. Stella is part of the Hero Squad that engages young students in learning empathy and teamwork in support of LLS. Stella, can you tell me what LLS is? LLS is an organization that raises money to give to doctors. Really? And, and why do we need to raise money for LLS? So people can be with their families and they will feel better. What do the doctors do with the money? They get ingredients so they can make new medicines. Terrific. And do you know what is blood cancer? It's a sickness that some people have. Do you know anyone in your family that has a blood cancer? Yes, my Uncle James. Oh, and can you tell me what Uncle James means to you? I love him and he always makes me smile. Oh, that's sweet. And tell me a little bit about your fundraising. How do you raise money? You make videos and then you ask people in the videos if they will donate to LLS. Great. And is it fun to raise money? Yes. What's the most fun part about it to you? Well, if you like coloring, then making the banners are the most fun thing. And have you made a banner? Yes. Can you show it to us? Mm -hmm. It is right here. Oh, terrific. Can you tell me a little bit about why it's important to be part of the Hero Squad? Being a hero means helping out people and LLS our heroes. How does it make you feel in your heart to be a hero? 
Well, being a hero means helping people and and if you donate to LLS, you're being a hero. Is there anything you'd like to tell to all of the um, blood cancer patients out there? Yes. What would you like to say? Well, I'm just so glad that LLS is here to support people that has a sickness. Wonderful. Anything else you want to say? Well, I'm really glad that they're here because being a hero means helping people and it's the right thing to do to help people even when no one is looking. Terrific. Thank you. Now, I am not asking you to create a banner because I do think Stella has that one covered. But I am asking you to be a hero. Women control over 32 trillion in worldwide spending according to a 2020 Catalyst report. We make up more than half of the US population and we influence 85% of consumer spending. Today, approximately 40% of US working women out earn our husbands, and that's from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. Ladies, we have the means. All we need is the commitment. As a member of Women Curing Cancer, I see the difference that I make. I receive updates through the years. I can uh, participate in roundtable discussions. I attend events like this. I see how LLS is changing the paradigm of cancer research and progress. Please join us. And now I'm gonna turn it back to Dr. Gwen Nichols, our Chief Medical Officer. Well, thank you, Marla. Um, and thank you to everyone who took time out of their day today to, to join us. This, um, this group uh, is very empowering. And if you are um, someone who, who wants, to, wants to help and understands how important it is to have women's voices and the things that are important to women recognized and, and pushed forward, join us. Join Marla, join Lynn, join Evelyn. Please, uh, this is a great group and we thank you for taking the time. We thank you for helping us if you're able and we look forward to having you at future events. And one final thank you to Suleika. Um, uh, I think you will really, really enjoy reading this book. Um, and thank you to all of my uh, colleagues at LLS who uh, worked so hard to make this happen. Have a great afternoon and thank you again. Just a little girl Frightened by this great big world Around me She calmed me down And in those teenage years When things got rough I'd give in and I'd give up She'd be right there for me My mama gave me strength And told me She's the only reason I got through it She said be strong When times are tough and everything goes wrong You can cry those tears but when they're gone You carry on You be strong She calmly explained it all I cried and asked God why Doctor said it was her last spring She said doctors don't know everything 
Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon.